Good morning, folks. Hope everyone is doing well. We've had a bunch of shop updates that are worth sharing with you guys on things that were going well and a couple of things that I'm probably falling a little bit behind on. Uh, but I want to start right over here on the horizontal. If you've been following on the podcast, you knew that we've had some issues because we're now re being required to separate our steel and aluminum. And that really puts a wrench in running this machine uh, lights out, which it does every day because we were running mixed material. I spent quite a bit of time learning about physical and magnetic and other sorts of separation. And the conclusion is um, those just didn't make sense for us. Um, there, there could be ways we could do it, but they just don't make sense. And the better solution uh, was actually really simple. The sort of next phase of growth for us was to have this horizontal just be a dedicated steel machine. We have the sort of the need for that, or we soon will. So I'll show you guys in a second, but we're taking a Haas BF2 and kind of repurposing it to be an aluminum dedicated machine. Uh, and then that solves this whole issue. And then we picked up, um, I actually really like this, the uh, Dakota Metal Solutions, it's just a chip hopper. This is, I think, a half yard, maybe a third. Um, many folks make these. I, I think this is a really nice design. It's, it's on wheels, so we can wheel it around. It's got the forklift slot, and then when you lift it up and you pull the chain, uh, it will automatically dump. And we're, we're actually still dumping that into Gaylord boxes. We might at some point move to a roll-off container, but the short answer is this solves the problem for now. Another awesome update on the horizontal is we figured out a way to read the hex value of the Okuma when the all coolant off button is pushed. Um, this strikes me as such an obvious thing. Under normal circumstances, I don't really want this machine to run when the all coolant off button is pushed, or rather I want a really uh, deliberate warning to the operator. And we figured out a way, this is probably worth its own video for other folks that may want to do this, but basically now if the all coolant button is pushed Anytime a program starts or a new tool is loaded when that button is pushed, you, the program pauses, you get a warning, you need to clear the warning and then override it with a cycle start to continue moving forward. This stops that problem of, you know, you're inspecting an end mill and it's fine, and, so you, and you had coolant off for that, and then you walk away and the next tool is a through spindle coolant drill and it blows up the body and, and maybe even worse. I also got really tired of being at the operator console and not knowing what tombstone is next. Now, this has a six pallet pool, uh, pallet pool system. And what one is next depends on whether it's in the right position to flip it around. And all else equal, it's a relatively slow system. It takes 40 seconds probably to shuffle in and out uh, the pallets. And so I'm really happy with this solution. We purchased an inexpensive um, HDMI monitor and I snaked a, an HDMI cable around there and we mounted, I'll put the link in the description, but one of these uh, Amazon security cameras and it just points right there so we know without having to walk away what's next in the uh, load station or even sometimes it ends up that it's empty there's always one empty pot and then you'll get a weird undescript you know nondescript alarm when you try to rotate a pallet and you're like what is going on and man we were walking from the operator position we were stepping back and walking all the way over here numerous times a day to figure out what was next if we're trying to work on something. And so just a little quality of life improvement that I'm actually really happy with. Similarly, we made sure all of our tombstones now have mailbox numbers on them right there. Bought some of these, uh, Home Depot or Amazon. And then this is actually not holding up great, but what we had done uh, was put them on and use this stuff called Mod Podge from the hobby store. It seemed like a pretty good, um, Thing that can help secure labels on. In fact, I'll show you another example. I'm a little embarrassed because most of the other ones, you can see right there, the, the four has held up pretty well. The five has held up pretty well. And it was on Tombstone 2, we wanted to put some labels up on the Tombstone itself. And if you just put, um, you know, the Brother or Avery style labels on those machines, on the Tombstones, the coolant will just eat them off. But using that Mod Podge over them has worked great. Um, even better than paint pens, which we have found also wear off over time. And finally, we have an air gun right here, which we actually added this one, 3D printed magnetic um, thing holds it right there. And we have another one over there on the load station, but um, I didn't want these at full shop pressure. And I frankly didn't want to buy and deal with having large regulators uh, for each one of them. And we found 
another thing I'll put the link to, um, but we found these little inline regulators right here, and you can adjust them. They stay put when, after they've been adjusted, and that can help throttle back your air just a little bit. Um, we've also tried using, uh, I think I've got one, actually this one right here has an adjustment on it, as well as I've got a fancier one that's uh, I think a little bit more, I um, can't remember how they make it, market it, but it has some sort of a better nozzle in terms of ear safety, which, which absolutely matters because those, those can make a lot of noise. Yeah, these are really nice, but we were finding that too often they would either intentionally or accidentally get moved to the full open position, and that was more air than I wanted it to be, so those inline regulators just helped control that. And for those of you that have followed uh, this channel and our story, you know that's an empty space right now. Um, in the best way possible, uh, our Willem and actually, uh, we're gonna walk over to it right now, but yesterday was its final day here. Um, we bought that machine, which is a pretty big, you know, investment, not to say risk, but um, different, you know, gamble on would this platform make sense for us and 100% proved out that thesis. I absolutely love this machine. Here she is, she's wrapped up, she's headed to a new home. Um, we made thousands of parts on it. I absolutely love it and we're excited to have a new one hitting our floors probably late July. Uh, we wanted the newer ones, first off, not 20 years old. We're gonna invest in uh, you know, business case for building out a product line around these, these items. I didn't wanna do that on a 20 year old machine. Um, things are going to break, and things will break on every machine, but 20 years old machine that has had, I think it was two and a half million tool changes. Um, more things are gonna wear out quickly on that, including some pretty expensive five figure replacements around spindles and axes and so forth. So I sort of thought, hey, makes sense to uh, look at a new one. And the big difference is that exact same machine, a 408 MT, uh, the new version of it uh, has a much larger groove bore diameter, steps up to, I guess, 36 millimeters, which is about one and three eighths of an inch. And for a lot of the products that we make, uh, having that increased diameter uh, relative to our current machine that we're selling, which was 25 millimeters, which is just under one inch, um, that extra diameter is huge for what we're trying to do. So we're really excited to have that machine uh, get here. Over here in the shipping area, though, I've been really happy. Uh, Serena's been doing a great job of how we keep this clean and organized. We've got our plate inventory here. Uh, we now use a shipping scale. We got rid of our pallet jack that had the built-in scale. It was just clunky for us, at least. And then uh, I'll come back to this guy. We ordered this um, dolly crate table off Amazon and absolutely love it. Um, I thought we were going to use it for a reason I don't even remember now. And it ends up that it's just been great for dropping the pallet on here and it allows us to pack the pallet and do the work we need to do by hand. Um, and then we just wheel it around to the forklift and lift it up, weigh it as needed. And then see, we've got one right over there going out the door. So from an operator comfort standpoint, uh, that's been a big win. And this is our idea, a test idea uh, for a new anodizing crate. We had built, let's see if I can find one. I think they're back up here on the racking wall though. Yeah, right here's one. So we built these years ago, or had them built, uh, and they're great, but something I did not anticipate, uh, it's quite obvious now, but didn't at the time, is, I'm curious if anybody can think of it before uh, I say it, feel free to post that in the comments below. What's the design flaw here? The design flaw is it holds 12 plates, and it does a great job at keeping them secure, and it's built like a tank, and that's the design flaw. It only holds 12 and it weighs 300 pounds. So we're sending this back and forth two times a month, a lot of times, sometimes once a month, but a lot of times two times a month um, with LTL freight. And freight is effectively by the pound. So we're spending uh, probably thousands of dollars a year extra because of how overbuilt that is. Now, look, I want the plates protected. I wasn't wanting to, to obviously end up in a situation where they're damaged, but this is our new idea that we're about to test that we built and what I love about it is that it holds far more plates, uh, just under 30, and it's a little bit modular. So if we happen to need a thicker plate for some reason, which we don't really do that often, but we have, we can pull these out to fit a thicker plate. We can also, we can also pull the, the inserts out to clean this. And what I love about it is the far side, as well as this side, 
they fold down. So it makes it much easier for us to reach in and do a two-man lift where you're grabbing the plate from the side versus having to try to reach down like this and lift the plate out. It's also totally toolless and keyless. There's nothing that comes off the crate. Uh, we've got some final latches coming in, but basically the lid goes down, the other lid comes over. I did that out of order. We're gonna get rid of that window latch and replace it with two latches here that'll secure it down in place. Uh, and this just does a LTL milk run um, to, to an anodizer. So um, it needs to be built well and built to last, but it's not being handled by third parties going across distribution facilities all over the country, blah, blah, blah. So um, we, also, we started it off also on a U-line plastic pallet um, my thought was that it would hold up better over time, and we might add some metal corner brackets just for some extra out exterior protection, but really happy with so far with how that's turning out. One of the topics on days off in the shop, do it, uh, was really taking that absolute next level of improving our tooling. We had already done the Gridfinity bins with some of these labels, um, and that was fine, but when I sort of just turned, turned off everything just went and sat and thought for a minute i realized no this could be even better so some of the newest ones are now gridfinities with two color prints so that the information that we need is labeled right in here yet again a step further is we want to add the lex id to make it even order to easier to reorder and then what i really love now is i'll actually pick another one's a really good example is right here we have the inserts we have an extra body and then we have the screws right here in the exact same gridfinity setup so you're no longer having to wonder where are the screws for that insert another days off in the shop project is our drill press now this drill press is the og drill press this is from my new york city manhattan apartment and i love that we still have it we honestly don't use it that very often but when i do use it i find that Frankly, it's usually a mess. And number two is it never seems to have the vice or work holding that I want on it. And usually I want either just a block of wood to drill into something sacrificial, a little bit more of a, not precise, but you know, decent screw style vice or just a quick, quick action vice like this. And I realized this is simple. So Alex is working on a fixture plate design where we can mount onto this. We have enough rotation area where we can have all three of those devices mounted that we want. We'll probably be able to take the wood block off too if you just want a big flat surface there. So you no longer have to fuss with switching that out. And then uh, I bought a little vacuum. I think this is gonna be too underpowered, but we're gonna permanently mount a dust deputy right next to it with the cord kind of right here so that when you're done, you can flip that switch on, dust deputy up as you needed. Um, these are great. If you don't know these things that pull a Venturi or something that puts all of the junk in the bucket, and it keeps your filter and your shot back perfectly clean. So they're, other than emptying the five gallon bucket, they're basically maintenance free and there's no filter, which is great. Also two sort of fun share slash PSAs. Uh, DSI is running another Fusion Summit. This one is in the end of May in Chicago. We'll put the link in the description, but I unfortunately have a scheduling conflict. Otherwise I have been to the one in Charlotte and where's the last one? can't think of, uh, oh, California. They're absolutely great. There's folks from industry, folks from Autodesk. They're presenting some really good topics on uh, Fusion Cam, really manufacturing focus. So if anybody is either in the Chicago area or interested, um, I really wanna support these in the sense that I like what Autodesk has done and I hope continues to do, um, in this case through DSI, but, but sort of building that in-person Fusion community for a chance to learn, pay it forward, share knowledge, um, having the product managers there is, is awesome to learn firsthand from the folks that are designing these software tools. Absolutely love it. And the other one, which is really cool, uh, Tormach just released the 1500MX. Total game changer of a machine. Uh, you know, really fond memories for me back to my New York basement days with my 1100S2. You know, I made so many parts for the Strike Park business, the GoPro Picatinny mounts for ARs on our original Tormach. And look, I wouldn't be here today without that stepping stone. And for me, that was the right path. And this Tormach machine is, is nothing like the S2 that came out, whatever that was, 14 years ago. Um, it's linear rails, it's super fast, it's epoxy granite. The epoxy granite frames are actually made in Ohio, which is pretty cool. Um, Ethernet or EtherCAT system, the path pilot interface, which is wonderful. Um, it's an absolute game changer step up. You know, wireless probing, through spindle coolant conveyor, kind of like everything you could have wished for. So I, I want to personally congratulate Torbach on that machine. Um, I hope I get the chance to use one or see one one day. And I know some folks who have had some chance to get their hands on one and 
uh, the, lo it looks really promising, so that's awesome. Um, thank you to everybody who came to our sort of uh, yard sale slash mini open house. Uh, we might do another one at some point, so, you know, we might do another one at some point, so feel free to stay tuned. We posted most of that stuff on Instagram and the Business of Machine podcast, but before we wrap up, I did want to take this chance to do a PSA and say we are selling three machines. So if anybody is interested, um, we'll have links with pricing in the description to uh, a UMC 500 SS with basically every single option and like a couple hundred spindle hours, um, basically a brand new machine with the 10 pallet pool. We have a UMC 350 HD five axis machine, which is great. It's basically a DT2, so really small footprint um, and really capable machine. And our ST20Y sub spindle, live tooling, Y axis, um, almost, almost identical to our machine next door. Uh, also has Royal column systems on each of them. Also with, I think a few hundred spindle hours at most, chip conveyor, again, really, really well option. Unfortunately, uh, Vince, our training class instructor, moved to Arizona. I wish him the best. It was awesome to bring back the training classes, but with him gone, we didn't have another instructor we could sort of find and bring in here. And so, unfortunately, and this is one of those tough decision, decisions we had to make, um, I got to focus on what we're doing over at Saunders, at least for now. I would love to bring the training classes back. I have found a lot of personal fulfillment in offering that chance for folks to come for three days and learn turning, to learn five axis, to learn three axis. But, um, we just can't pull it off right now, and that's the end of it. So these machines have to go. If anybody is interested, please reach out. Um, they are going to sell. They will not be here uh, probably by no later than this summer. So as always, folks, thank you for following along. I appreciate it. Uh, hope everyone else is doing well. Hope you learned something. Take care. See you soon.